Before I even arrive at the Oval Office, I will have the disastrous war between Russia and Ukraine settled. It will be settled quickly. Quickly. I will get the problem solved, and I will get it solved in rapid order, and it will take me no longer than one day. I know exactly what to say to each of my I will have that war settled between Putin and Zelensky as president-elect before I take office on January. Wow. That was uh, – he. that first clip we showed there was from 2023, uh, where Trump made that pretty declaratory statement about how he would – in the war in the Ukraine, should he come back into office? And he never he never hesitated from that. He continued to say it all the way through. And now he has been na- named the president-elect. In, in a shocking turn of events, uh, we've been talking about this a number of times, and certainly everybody on uh, on the television, on the major news networks, they all had an idea. The, the polls were almost exactly deadlocked before the thing went into it. We actually showed uh, one, I think, just yesterday that the final NBC News poll had it literally completely deadlocked at 49% to 49% with two undecided. Uh, and and then uh, when all the votes were counted, uh, man, it, it turned out to be a pretty big win for Trump. Uh, it, it looks like he's going to both win the the uh, uh, popular vote as well as the uh, the, the uh the other vote that I just went crazy. I just lost uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, other vote. Sorry, just went blank on that. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, look, here's the big thing, because the, the real question is what really people care about is what's going to happen with the war in Russia, Ukraine. Now, th- for a long time, Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, uh, has really been stressing about this. I mean, why wouldn't he be? Because if Harris had won, uh, it was going to be the continuation of the status quo. They were just going to keep on for as long as it takes, et cetera, with no end state in mind. And Trump had been saying since 2023 that he was going to go down this path and bring the war to a conclusion. Um, and then he also said, uh, and, and I actually want to show this in, um, first of all, uh, this is from actually Trump in 2019. So during his first ter- term in office, I'm going to show you kind of, kind of get a running start into this kind of where Trump's mind has been, uh, where it, and then where it is now, and then where it's probably going to be on January 20th when he takes the oath of office for the second time. So here he is in 2019 with Volodymyr Zelensky. Uh, He's talking about it in the context here about some of the things that Trump gave him that Obama had not in terms of a certain kind of weapon. But pay attention to the back half of this about where Trump's mind is. We put up a lot of money. I gave you anti-tank busters that, frankly, President Obama was sending you pillows and sheets. And I gave you anti-tank busters. And a lot of people didn't want to do that, but I did it. And I really hope that Russia, because I really believe that President Putin would like to do something, I really hope that you and President Putin get together and can solve your problem. That would be a tremendous achievement. And I know you're trying to do that. You know, we've talked about this before, that oftentimes uh, the body language for Zelensky and, and his facial expressions are sometimes quite telling. And you can certainly see in that one where uh, he was just like, that is not what I want to hear. And I, I'm sure that and his, his body language said, I, you know, this is where I, I want to be anywhere besides here. Uh, you can see it right there. Look at that face. He's just like going, oh, man, that is not what I, I don't want to hear making deals with with uh, Putin. I just want more weapons and, and more of other kinds of uh, ability to support the war. And that continued on. And, and, and listen, that, that just showed you where Trump's mind was uh, even back then. He's he's given weapons, but he's saying, I, I, I'm not giving weapons because I want you to fight and win a war. I, I, I'm giving you weapons to defend yourself so that you can have a good position to have a negotiated settlement or to resolve the problems because there hadn't been a war at that point. There had been the uh, the, the, the Russians had been supporting the uh, separatists in the Donbass area. And of course, they had annexed the Crimea in 2014. And, and there was never going to be any prospect that that uh, was going to come back. Never. Once that uh, uh, Putin annexed uh, the uh, the Crimea in 2014, it was never, ever going to come back. I mean, I mean, look, the population itself, and this is really uh, ignored a lot in the West. It was there was a plebiscite there which genuinely represented the uh, uh, view of the people 
even uh, prior to all of this, when, when you looked at how the voting patterns had gone down uh, in Ukraine when Crimea was still a part of Ukraine, it was like 90 percent uh, ethnic Russians. And so when they voted out there, uh, even though it was decried in the West, it, it uh, was almost certainly uh, genuinely representative of the people that were in there. So that's that was never coming back. So that was never even on Trump's radar to try and get that back. He just wanted to get the war over with. He wanted to get the, the conflict off the table. And and look, Trump is oftentimes accused of being pro-Putin and, and he loves dictators and all that. And, and I get why those kind of comments are made. But when you look at the reality of what he has actually done, what he has what he has done actually makes some sense. Because President Trump is wanting to talk to people, and in the, in the current elite of the of the United States, and this is not just the Democrats. There's a lot of Republicans, a lot of Republicans uh, in this same boat there that you don't talk to anybody you don't like. So the current administration, almost at least not publicly, never talks to Russia, and I don't think they have since this war started. Now, Biden certainly hasn't. And look, if if you're not talking to your adversaries then upon what basis do you ever have any chance to solve things at a lower level? Because that's what, what you see here. It, it was the current administration. How long did it take them even to go to talk to China at the, uh, at the secretary of state level? It was a long time and it was a, it was a big disaster. A lot of, you may not remember that at the time, but it was our first meeting with China was just disastrous. And then it was, I think more than a year before we talked to them again after that. And obviously we don't talk to North Korea, uh, we don't uh, very little. Uh, we don't talk to to Ukraine. I'm sorry, to to uh, the uh, uh, Russia, and we don't talk to to Iran as well. So we want all these things to work out for our good. We want to do things, but we don't want to talk to anybody. Whereas Trump's saying, "I'll talk to anybody." He's even offered to talk to Iran in some cases. He's very hawkish on Iran, generally speaking, but he has made comments that he's willing to talk to anybody so that he can get an outcome that's beneficial to the United States. And oftentimes it's used as a caricature about Trump, you know, being America first, and uh, that's ridiculed in many circles here in the United States and even in Europe. Uh, but look, it, it's supposed to be normal that any government elected by any country and the people in its country, they're first priority, you shouldn't even have to say this out loud, is to take care of your country and your people. Once you've done that, then you can look to help others as well. You can have alliances, you can have a, a, you know friendly relations with different folks, you can talk to any number of people, but your priority should always remain taking care of your people first. And you see that's a consistent pattern in there. Um, and, and then, so that was, we've shown you now 2019, uh, and now I want to run back to a little bit more uh, currently, and you'll see during the debate, when at the, the first debate that President, uh, now President-elect Trump had with Joe Biden uh, in June, I believe it was the, when they had that first debate, he was very much focused on taking care of America. We are very, very close to World War III, and he's driving us there. And Kim Jong-un and uh, President Xi of China, Kim Jong-un of North Korea, uh, all of these, Putin, they don't respect him. They don't fear him. They have nothing going with this gentleman, and he's going to drive us into World War III. So you see, again, when it comes to, to war and peace, Trump is all about trying to solve things at the lowest possible level. He's about keeping us out of war. And, and unfortunately, uh, what some, sometimes called the uniparty, which is kind of the foreign policy elite in the United States that think that every problem and you've seen, I mean, you've said the likes of Liz Cheney, uh, apparently her, her dad, Dick Cheney, uh, lots of these other, uh, uh, what is it? I think that there was uh, somewhere around some famous letter that was going around of uh, a 200 famous Russia, uh, uh, Republicans that, that endorsed uh, Kamala Harris. You had uh, one of the last things I saw in the week before the election was over 1,000 uh, generals, colonels, uh, and former uh, high-ranking uh, the State Department officials endorsed Kamala Harris. They said, yep, yeah, we're endorsing her. What does that tell you? And then they lost. Those things I think we're going to see and when, when people really dissect all what happened in this election. I think a lot of that backfired because that's not what the American people want. We don't want to lead with a barrel of a gun on every problem. It's, it's supposed to be an article of faith that you, first of all, take care of your people, but also that you take care of problems at the lowest possible level, at the lowest cost, with the highest benefit for your side. 
That's the way it's supposed to work. So that means you got to talk to some people you don't want to. That means you have to do some things that you may not want to and, and that you have to actually have a possibility. I know this is heresy to some that the other side can get something it wants. That used to be just normal diplomacy. That used to be just how it worked. In the, and I'm talking world affairs, not even just the United States. That if you want to have a negotiated settlement, if there's something that's really important to you, you got to find something that the other side that's important to you, that, that you can you can live with them having this as long as I get this thing that's really important to me. And, and if if you do that, if you have in the chance of any sort of a win-win to come out, then you have that possibility to get a bunch of wins that are good for your side. And if the other side also gets some things that they want, that should be okay. We have this mentality right now, this these, these uniparty elite, as I call them, that says, no, we have to get everything that we want, and they have to get nothing that they want. And, and that's what's animated why we're still at war and, and now closing in on three years in this Russia-Ukraine war, because no one wants Russia to have anything. We want them to lose. Okay, whatever. That's that's what you want. Fine. That's, that's, that's a desire that you have. It's a free country. But if you can't accomplish that outcome, if you can't get to there at a, at a price that's affordable in a time frame that's reasonable, or if you can't get there at all, then you have to abandon that course of action. That's what the current administration, that's what candidate Harris was going to go down the path as well, oblivious to the realities on the ground. All they wanted to focus on was what their, their preferred outcome was. And then even when you can see and count in many cases tangibly why this is not going to come to pass, you're not going to get the outcome you seek, they wouldn't accede to that reality, and they just continued to go forward anyway. Uh, last summer, uh, David Sachs, uh, investor who we've had on our show a few times, uh, he made a lot of news, and he was one of the first uh, really that kind of got behind Trump in, in a public way uh, that, that a number of people followed after. Uh, and you can't draw a direct correlation to it, but certainly when you look at the polling that, that happened not long after Sachs endorsed Trump is, is when, especially if you look at the 538 uh, polls that went all the way forward up to the, the election date, you saw a definite uh, tick up. And especially from about October, it, it, the, the, the numbers continued to narrow and close uh, between the two. So uh, I, I'm not going to go so far as to say it was David Sachs' fault, but he was one of the early ones that pushed in this direction. And I think that the things that he said and some of the reasons why he endorsed Trump uh, was was resonating with a lot of people. And I think that, again, when they do a postmortem on this election, I think they're going to see that this resonated with a lot of people. Here was David Sachs explaining why he backed Trump on our show. Trump has said several things publicly. Um the first is that in that famous town hall he did with Caitlin uh, Clark, I think from CNN, uh, where she tried to pin him down in terms of, well, are you on Putin's side or are you on Ukraine's side? And he said that I'm on the side of, you know, not wanting people to keep dying. And he said, you know, a number of times that he would, he could end the war in 24 hours. He'd basically uh, seek a negotiated settlement. He's also talked quite a bit about burden sharing. He fundamentally thinks that Europe should be paying more for, for NATO, should be fundamentally paying for its own defense, and that uh, with respect to the Ukraine war, that the Europeans should be paying for it. Now, that's not as clear a statement that we should just get out of it completely, but it does indicate that this war is not a priority for him. Yeah, see, the war is not a priority. It's not supposed to be a priority for anyone. And, and you see in the, in the way that that question he referred to, there was a CNN uh, interview that, uh, that Trump had done, and uh, they, they tried to, I, I think, get a gotcha moment to where they wanted to say, well, whose side are you on? Do you want Ukraine to win or do you want Russia to win? It was a false choice. The, the, he, he answered it really good. I don't, I, I'm not even about who's going to win and lose. I'm about ending a war that can't be won. And it's, it's just unfortunate and regretful that the, the major news media and certainly all that supported the uh, the Harris campaign didn't understand that. And, and, and I don't know if they were unable to understand it or unwilling to look at what the truth was on the ground and say, hey, this is never going to work. It's it, You can be for Ukraine all day long. 
and you can be against Russia until the cows come home. But if there's not a military path for Ukraine to succeed, and that means if they don't have the manpower, they don't have the level of training, they don't have the industrial capacity, they don't have the armaments that are necessary or the systems, as, as Colonel Jacques Beau has said numerous times on our show, if you don't have any of those things, there is no rational path to say that we can achieve this at any cost over any time. Because what we're going to have now is that even without Trump having come in, even if Harris had won, they were still not going to avoid that outcome. In fact, if you don't get a negotiated settlement, if Trump doesn't make good on, on that claim that he made we showed at the top here, then eventually Russia is going to win the war. They're going to win in a military fashion. I don't know if they're ever going to do a, 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 a what I call a big arrow movement where they had this, you know, bring in an, another 100, 200,000 people on a on a portion of the uh, the line somewhere and, and break through brutal defenses and, and, and march, you know, toward the capital again. Or if they just stay with their slow and methodical pace forward, uh, it doesn't make any difference. Sooner or later, the Russian side will win because the fundamentals are on their side in an attrition-based warfare. It's going to always land on the side that has the, the inputs that can win. And, and the, the Ukraine side has none of them. They have none of them. So why then would we want to continue going down a path that can't succeed instead of one that can? Now, that's been the case so far. Uh, but uh, and, and the, the next part uh, that and Sachs on his own podcast, he, he nailed down Trump a little bit more because Trump actually went on his podcast, the All In podcast, and he point blank asked him, are you going to is there any chance that you would ever send U.S. boots on the ground to fight Russia for Ukraine? Can you guarantee that no matter what, you're not going to put American boots on the ground in Ukraine? Is that something you can say definitively? I would now? guarantee no. it. I wouldn't do it. No, it's different for France. You know, they're neighbors, more or less. We have an ocean in between. Well, to make a peace deal there, would you be willing to take NATO expansion off the table if that's what it took to get the Russians and the Ukrainians to make a deal? Would you be willing to do that? So for 20 years, I heard that NATO, uh, if Ukraine goes into NATO, it's a real problem for Russia. I've heard that for a long time. And I think that's really why this war started. I'm not sure that this war would have started. Uh, Biden was saying all of the wrong things. And one of the wrong things, he was saying, no, Ukraine will go into NATO. That's one of the many things he said. When I listened to him speak, I said, this guy is going to start a war. Because as you know, for four years, there was never even talk of Russia going into Ukraine. That would have never happened. Russia was not going to attack Ukraine. As soon as I got out, they started to form along the lines. And I thought that Putin maybe will. He's a good negotiator. I thought he was going to be doing that for negotiation purposes. Then all of a sudden they attacked. And I said, what's going on here? But if you look at the rhetoric from Biden, uh, he, he was saying the opposite of what, in my opinion, you had to say. Well, and, and yes, and we validated that numerous times because there, there was a deal. So you saw that in 2019, that, that Trump was saying, hey, I want you and Russia to get together and talk, and I want you to win this. Now, what Trump didn't know at the time was that in 2021, and, and only in probably in many years from now, are we going to find out exactly what happened behind the scenes, because Trump is always talking about, I want y'all to have a conversation and, and figure a way out of this. There was the Minsk agreements that were on the table at that time, actually had been signed. It was outright agreements that could have simply been implemented, uh, and with enough uh, diplomatic pressure, there could never, there, there would have never been the possibility. There would have never been the need for a war because Trump was not going to bring NATO into Ukraine. At least he didn't put any action towards it. And he wanted the thing to be settled in here. But in 2021, in early 2021, after Biden came into office, all of a sudden Zelensky signs this document that says they're going to retake the Donbass area where the separatists were. Basically, they had been fighting civil war since 2014 that now then they were going to take them back by force if necessary. And that's that started the, the countdown for, for a war. And, and Russia built up a lot of forces around because they said that we're not going to allow that. We're not going to sit passive by to let you move militarily against those the separatists in the, in the east. And at the same time, talking about putting NATO, because once Biden came in, they were again talking more aggressively about bringing Ukraine into NATO. So that went completely against anything that was on the ground. And so now then Russia, uh, in June of 21, Putin meets with uh, President Biden. 
And according to a diplomatic source that I have talked to uh, that has knowledgeable about that meeting, that uh, Putin told him, if you bring Ukraine into NATO, if you stay with that path, it's going to be war. And Biden reportedly said, OK, do whatever you think you need to do, but we're not going to listen to you and we're going to go ahead and go forward anyway. And if you try it, we're going to crip cripple your country, your economy and all this kind of stuff. But we know what happened with that. And we know also from Jen Stoltenberg, who admitted absolutely overtly in December of 2023 that, that yes, Putin did give us that option to avoid war by just saying no NATO in Ukraine. And we ignored it. Putin then went forward and did exactly what he said he was going to do, what's in his national interest. So, yeah, I think there is some some justification and some validity to Trump claiming if I had been in office, this this war would not have happened. OK, he wasn't in office. It did happen. But now that he's coming back into office again. And so the question is going to be, what is he going to do next? Now, in a meeting that was, uh, I think, back in September, so not not long ago, uh, Zelensky came into town for the, uh, I believe it was for the UN General Assembly uh, that was going to be given at the time. And he had a kind of a famous uh, event with Trump. Now, as you watch what's coming next, note the categorical similarity with what he said here and what he said in 2019 to see if you see consistency. So we have a very good relationship. And I also have a very good relationship, as you know, with President Putin. And I think uh, if we win, I think we're going to get it resolved very quickly. Very well. I really think we're going to get it resolved. I hope we have more good relations. We're going to have. Oh, I see. Yeah. But, but, you know, it takes two to tango, you know. and. Yeah. So, so you see, even then, Zelensky was wanting Trump to say, I'm going to keep supporting you and I want you to win the war. And instead, Trump said the same thing he said in 2019, the same thing he said in 2023, the same thing he said earlier in 2024, that he's going to bring the war to an end. And he continues to say that because that is his priority, is to get wars off the table so we can focus on diplomatic and economic means. Trump being the businessman that he is, uh, his priority has always been doing things that make business, good business sense and economic sense for the United States and help us with trade and tariffs and whatever else. I don't want to get into all of his tariffs and, and uh, some of those other things. Those are, we'll do that on another show. But we're talking right now war and peace and what is in the best interest of the United States. War is definitely not. Now, one of the other things, uh, talking about the, the now Trump administration that's coming in, uh, J.D. Vance, in an in a, uh, interview with CNN earlier this year, uh, was very specific on why he was in. Now, this was before he was announced as the vice presidential candidate. Uh, this is when he was, uh, at that time, just Senator J.D. Vance. And he explained why he was had the position that he did about not supporting Ukraine. The National Review is basically saying that your solution to the problem of Russia invading a sovereign nation, Ukraine, is to just surrender. Are they wrong? No, look, my solution to the problem is to rebuild our own country. The reason that we're in this position, Jake, is because we're stretched way too thin. We're stretched way too thin. And the number of weapon systems that we need, the Ukraine needs, that Taiwan needs, that Israel needs, and we can't do all of these things at once. So when you're stretched too thin, you've got to focus and you've got to rebuild your own country. Let's take just one of those weapon systems that we're talking about, 155 millimeter artillery shells. The Russians currently have a five to one advantage over the Ukrainians. The Israelis will need this stuff. The Taiwanese need this stuff. And of course, America needs this stuff. Can we possibly fight all of those conflicts at once? No, the math just doesn't make sense. So what we should be doing is with Ukraine, encouraging them to take a defensive posture, not these disastrous counteroffensive the Biden administration has been promoting. The counteroffensive is within Ukraine, though. The counteroffensive is within Ukraine. They're not seeking land from Russia. And in fact, just no, today, I, I, I'm not just, passing judgment on the morality of what they're doing. Of yeah. course, it's their territory, Jake, but you have to acknowledge military reality on the ground. Yeah, you know, that's singing my tune right there. That's like music to my ears. You have to pay attention to reality on the ground. Now, I certainly hope that Senator Vance takes that same mentality into the White House as Vice President Vance and that that animates the the, uh, the incoming administration uh, just as much once they're in power as they have been as a candidate. Uh, it's you know, it remains to be seen. I know things are different once you get in office, but man, I really have to hope that they keep that focus of that mentality because that is the one chance we have to really keep this thing from expanding 
and to keep this any possibility of this exploding into a, a NATO on Russia fight, a U.S. on Russia fight, or or the possibility of nuclear escalation. I mean, they're focused on this stuff. And, and, and look, there's a couple of things that Vance said there that bear repeating and expanding upon. Uh, first of all, he was talking about you, you can't just do everything. Now, in that clip there, they didn't go into it any further. But we know because you've seen since you watch Deep Dive, you've seen us talk many times about the fact that already the United States is running dangerously low on interceptor missiles. We had Jake Sullivan, uh, who, who came in uh, to Kiev actually in September and admitted openly that we had to basically rob all of the interceptor missiles we had designated to go to 17 of our customers around the world, take all of them and give them to Ukraine. And it's still not even hardly, not even a fraction of what they actually need. And at the same time, we're firing interceptor missiles of our own in the Red Sea in defense of Israel on a couple of occasions there. And we do it routinely uh, against a lot of things from the Houthis as they continue to try uh, and fire into that area that we intercept some of those as well. And of course, we're giving more of those same things to Israel because they use a lot of them in their in their uh, air defense systems. Uh, we have two THAAD uh, batteries uh, air, in long range air defense interceptors. All these things we don't have enough. Our industrial capacity is slightly larger than it was in 2022, but only incrementally so. Nowhere close to be enough if we should ever have to fight a war. And I think that was animating part of his comments there. You can't just blithely go forward with your preferred outcome if it's cutting into your own ability to defend your nation. And that's what we've been doing so far. Uh, Secretary Austin has also admitted in public, in the open press, that we don't have enough long-range missiles. One of the reasons we didn't give Ukraine the authority to use our weapons to fire long-range into Russia is, is not just because of the, the threat that Russia made, but also because we don't have enough. He said neither the United States nor France uh, or UK, all of us together, we don't have enough to have a long-range campaign into Russia. And, and again, he knows that it wouldn't change the tide of war anyway. It doesn't have a tactical impact. I mean, you would have to do so very much more than just add some long-range missiles, which we understand. It, the, the people who are in charge understand, and yet... Even though they understand that, they never took the action to correct it and instead allowed things to continue drifting in an area that was antithetical to our own national security interests and did not make a difference for the Ukraine side. The only thing it did was get more Ukrainians killed. How many times have you heard us say that over this whole year uh, of this war here, that the longer you wait to have a negotiated settlement, the more Ukrainians are going to die, the more territory they're going to lose. And as we've been showing you on numerous recent episodes here, that territory is continuing to go at a faster clip. In fact, Gary, if you can pull up that graphic uh, from the New York Times, they put it in very stark detail. You can see here, this. if you're not familiar with this chart here, the, the red areas there show uh, territory physically gained by Russia. The blue on the bottom is territory physically gained by Ukraine. And uh, this starts in uh, November of 2022 on the far left and goes up through this current October. And you see that uh, after this offensive that the Ukraine side had in 2023, they did get some, especially starting in June. But you see how rapidly that uh, petered away. And then starting not long after that, uh, really by January, start, start, starting in January of 2024, you just had this methodical increase by the Russian side. Uh, and then in, uh, in the, I believe it was in July, you started seeing a spike in the amount of territory gained. And then you see July, August, September, October. Uh, there, was, there was more territory gained in October than in the entire 2022 by the Russian side. That is, that is hard to imagine that that was the case in just the one month here. And that, that pace is continuing on. What sense would it make for any administration to say, we're going to ignore all the ground truth reality that everything we're doing is failing and then just keep it going. I mean, it makes no sense at all because it, you, you can't get to your preferred outcome by ignoring, as JD Vance said, the ground truth reality. And that is why I'm, cautiously optimistic and hopeful that the incoming administration will significantly change course on what they're what the what the United States has been committed to because it can't succeed here this one I won't even call it success it can it can cut off the harm it can cut off the damage and start getting us into a place to where maybe we can start having some kind of a positive outcome 
for the Ukraine side. If you care about Ukraine, and I strongly, strongly care about the Ukrainian people, we've got to start adopting policies that have a chance to succeed, that have a chance to end the bloodshed, end the killing for the Ukraine side. In Look, one of the most egregious and underreported aspects of this war is that by continuing on, ignoring the reality, Ukraine is literally shoveling its men into, uh, like, like coal into a furnace, just throwing them by the buckets full into the abyss. People that they are going to need to try and rebuild their country. And so many of those who have already gone to war are going to be so racked with extra extraordinary levels of PTSD, physical war wounds. I mean, they are really, really hurting. And instead of stopping that, and starting the rebuilding process, we're still shoveling new bodies into it, people that can't be replaced. So if you care about Ukraine, then you should be happy that this is where the incoming administration is going to be going. And it would be great if the current administration says, all right, we're going to start moving on that path now because that's where the country is going. So it doesn't make any sense to keep going down this dumb path here that can't succeed right up until January 20th. And then we'll you know, have a hard right turn. Uh, back in the direction of something that makes sense. So we'll hope that's going to happen. Uh, we're I, I'm not the only one, apparently, that's uh, happy about some of this. Uh, Victor Orban uh, of Hungary, and we've talked about him a number of times. He gets a bad rap in the United States, and I think that's a, uh, that's a real shame because he has always been focused on economic prosperity and on regional peace. And, and wow, it's so embarrassing that, that we are demeaning somebody like that. But here's what he said when he heard that Trump had won. I see a shining victory, perhaps the biggest comeback in the history of Western politics. It's been a huge fight. He was threatened with prison. His wealth was confiscated. They wanted to kill him. The whole media world turned against him in America, and he still won. This means a big encouragement for those who believe in willpower, fighting, perseverance. For the world, it means the hope of peace. At the start of the year, we hoped that by the end of the year, the pro-peace forces would be in the majority, and we will defeat the pro-war forces. Now there is a huge chance for this. And if this happens, then the economy can take an upturn, and the US-Hungarian relations can return to the old golden age. We have several plans that we can achieve in the coming years with President Donald Trump. And, and I think that he's going to be proven right on that. I, I've, I've mentioned several times that I think that he saw where the winds were blowing. He saw where the, he did see the ground truth reality and he knew the war couldn't be won. And I think that's why he put a lot of political capital that he did earlier this year when he was the uh, rotating president of the EU. Uh, he put a lot of capital on the ground, took lots of heat from people, but he knew where this was going to go. And now it's playing out just like he thought. And I think that he's going to emerge from this in a much, much stronger position than many of the other heads of state uh, like Macron uh, or Keir Starmer or from the UK or Olaf Scholz who you know, keep going down this path that, that didn't ignore or that did ignore reality and couldn't succeed. Uh, you have uh, Fico from uh, the Slovakia, uh, who's been you know, you know an adamant uh, supporter of ending the war, finding a negotiated settlement. I suspect very strongly that now, it, uh, maybe not so much in the Baltics and in Poland, I'm sure they're going to continue to stay in their, their hard course there, but I bet a great many others in Europe start saying, okay, we're going to accede to what's coming because look, they're not going to keep going down a path that the Biden administration lacks where they know that there's the Trump administration about to come in. So I think that you're going to see a lot of changing positions in Europe uh, coming on very soon. And frankly, I think that there's a lot of people in Europe that are very grateful uh, for this outcome. I, th I think that there's a lot of these uh, states that went down this path uh, of supporting what the United States was saying just because we're the United States and they know that there's a quid pro quo to things. And if you oppose the United States, there's a cost to it. But I think privately they knew what is self-evidently true, that the war could not be won. And I think they're grateful to not have to shovel any more of their arms and ammunition and weapon systems and, and vehicles and tanks or whatever uh, into this meat grinder that has no possibility of success. So I think you're going to see a lot of people privately very happy about this and will not at all be upset about, uh, you know, welcoming in a, a Trump administration. They'll, they may have some challenges with him in some other areas, and I'm sure that they will. But in this particular area, uh, I think it's reasonable to project that uh, there's going to be a lot of support uh, for that. Now, on the other side of the of the the coin, there uh, the the Russian side is a little bit more circumspect. Uh, I saw the uh, some of their comments earlier today uh, from uh, Peskov. 
He's kind of in a wait and see area. That's the same thing that Trump or uh, President Putin is saying. That's, you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens, because uh, as, as we've also talked about many times on our show, the, the trust between the United States uh, and, and Russia is quite low. Um, and, you know, they see that it, uh, something that's agreed to by one administration can be turned over by the next. Uh, so they're not as excited about uh, going down any certain path. But, it, of course, because they are focused on their their interests, if the Russians determine that they can win something diplomatically as opposed to militarily, I think they are very much going to be willing to have that conversation with the Trump team once they take uh, office in uh, January of next year. We'll again have to wait and see. Uh, but I think it's uh, they'll probably continue on with their current process. Uh, you know, you saw that chart I just put up in there. Russia continues to move methodically and it at a quickening pace to the West. Uh, and and I, I don't see any reason that's going to change. And in fact, you know, you got to think from the Ukrainian side that, that this is a really, really troubling aspect. In fact, in the last bit of time here, let me just talk on that for a second, because it's one thing for Zelensky to be talking about this and that. But when you're talking about the guys who are actually fighting these battles, they already see that they they were told in 2023 that they're going to break through the Russian defenses and go to the Sea of Azov cut the land bridge of the Russians and, and put them in a position where they make it win the war in, in 2024. That was an, an utter fantasy, which was exposed by the reality, the harsh reality of combat to the tunes of tens, scores of thousands of men that were killed. Uh, and, and they've continued on to fight in the hope that they would have support. Now then that Trump is, is on the record and saying that, no, we're going to seek a negotiated settlement as soon as he gets into office. Now, why do you want to keep being thrown into these, you know, killer battles to where there's extraordinary amounts of Russian firepower, glide bombs, uh, rockets, artillery, uh, the tank fire, infantry, uh, uh, armor vehicles coming in? I mean, why would you want to continue literally throwing your life away and risking your life when you know the end is coming? So but almost certainly there's going to be some kind of negotiated settlement in, in 2025. Because the chances that that uh, that Trump gets in office and then reverses everything he said and just keeps on going down this path, uh, it just seems so remote as to be not even realistic to consider. And I assure you that the guys who are actually fighting are not going to be thinking that oh Trump will just change his mind. No, they they probably believe what he says and they can see with their own eyes what the imbalance actually is. So it is not inconceivable that the Ukraine side could, they could literally collapse between now and January. So the war might not even be going on at that point. Uh, and, and that's going to be a difficult thing to deal with too, because then that's going to be done under the Biden administration. And it's unclear how they would handle something like that. And obviously Zelensky doesn't want to handle something like that, but some of these things, folks, it's out of anybody's control because a lot of the times when these things happen, no one can predict it. It's possible that they'll keep fighting right up till the end and never break. I, I don't discount that possibility, but it's also you can't discount the possibility that the cost and the 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 pain gets so high that at some point they just lose their will to resist and say, well, I'm not going to sacrifice my life. I'm not going to be one of the last ones to die in a pointless war, you know, because now it's time to start looking to the future and trying to figure out how you're going to rebuild your country in the post-war period. And that's going to be a difficult uh, job. That's something else that the Trump administration is going to have to deal with, that all of Europe's going to have to deal with. There are some big, big bills to pay uh, for all what's happened so far. But we'll talk about that in another episode. I just want to leave you with one last time here, because uh, uh, a lot of people, uh, is, when you're talking about uh, this uh this outcome is, is was really uh, of Trump winning was really quite remarkable uh, because it looked for all the world that uh, that uh, Harris campaign had everything going for them at the end. They had all these Republican people uh, backing them, all these famous people, all these national security people, virtually every uh, major TV star and movie star and all these celebrities were all going back. It just looked like, they just had all the momentum. And then now that it's just this remarkable turnaround to where it's possible, uh, we have, we still don't have all the results yet for the, the uh, house of representatives, but it's possible that the Republican party could have a clean sweep, the trifecta, the political trifecta. They may have had the whole thing when they uh, launched that. W watch this note from last night when Fox news finally called it. 
The Fox News decision desk can now officially project that Donald Trump will become the 47th president of the United States. The former president's comeback will be complete with a win in Wisconsin, a state that he narrowly lost four years ago. He is now the second president in U.S. history to win non-consecutive terms. A history in the making, and now we'll see what happens in between now and January 20th of 2025, and you can count on Daniel Davis Deep Dive to give you all the scoops that happen in between now and then. Thanks very much, and we'll see you uh, on the next episode of Daniel Davis Deep Dive.